Hello, I'm Mike Redder, Coordinating Wildlife Biologist with Pheasants Forever and Quail Forever. And today we're going to discuss the benefits of wildlife management. What are the benefits to wildlife management and why do we manage for wildlife? How do we choose which species to manage for or do we really have to pick just one? Before we can manage for them, we need to consider what is important to them. What are the limiting factors for that species or species that we are looking to manage for? So we kind of have to identify management. What is management? Well, management is simply, or maybe not so simply, the process of trying to maintain a certain window in natural succession depending on the species we are targeting. For pheasants and quail and many of our upland species, which will be the target of the talk today, this area lies between turf grass or bare and pastures, but, but that gradual transition, but before it becomes a woodlot or a lot of woody succession. It's that balance in between there that we have good existing cover, but doesn't let it get too far away to where we limit the species that utilize that area. So before we do this, we probably are going to have to look at the, the way, change the way we look at habitat. You know, we may need to look at it in a different way or a better understanding of what actually quality habitat is. You know, taking areas that look like monocultural fields to fields of high diversity, because we understand that now that a lot, the more diverse the field is, uh, the more habitat or the more species that that habitat is beneficial for. And then understanding why an area like this and this view is so important and why I'll be referencing it several times throughout the conversation today. Now let's define what habitat is. Well, for that, it's gonna depend on the species in which we're utilizing. So whether we're talking about a bobwhite quail or we're considering our up migratory songbirds, or whether it's pollinators that are so important to us, or even other game birds that are out there. Understanding that we define the habitat for these individual species, but at times there's many overlaps, which may be beneficial. So understanding that habitat has components and we need to make sure that this, the habitat has all the requirements of the species that we're looking with. So that's food, water, cover, space, and, and arrangement. And a lot of us may remember learning about this basically from the basic triangle where we have water, food, and our arrangement and it depends for our birds or our species that we're managing for, that arrangement on where those requirements occur can also change throughout the year. So here's kind of, let's take quail for example. They have basically five different kinds of requirements throughout the year, or basically this is more timing. So some of the requirements can overlap, but they have a non-breeding season. That's typically, you know, our fall and winter months um, where survival uh, and mortality is very difficult. So those will have one types of requirement. Uh, covey breakup is simply when those birds are moving around to find uh, a lot of young birds moving to find their mates for the year and creating new coveys or establishing and, and rebuilding existing coveys. But the really important part throughout the year is nesting and brood rearing, understanding that all the species that I'll talk about today have high mortality rates. So we need to make sure that they have all the requirements to produce as many uh, young as possible so that we have a greater population going into fall on those non-breeding windows which in reality is winter where there is a lot of high mortality. So let's look at pollinator habitat, mainly because all the species that we mentioned previously, our upland birds and a lot of our upland game birds, all occupy a similar habitat. There's some small variances that they can tolerate, but essentially it's the same area. And we can look at this as calling this an umbrella species. If we target that umbrella species, we can maximize the benefit for several species rather than just to have to manage for one. So with our pollinator habitat, they do have some specific requirements, but all these requirements for pollinators actually benefits a lot of our, our birds that we're talking about, and we'll find out why here in a few minutes. But making sure that we have those multiple bloom periods, 
um, good quality nesting, uh, roosting, all that stuff, having all the host plants uh, for all those species, the various types of habitat or requirements as far as stem densities. And then also connecting those landscapes, knowing that we have to have in grass and egress and movement between habitats. So another very important factor is choosing an appropriate seed mix or trying to manage an area to have a maximum species throughout the growing seasons, meaning that we need to be able to provide uh, pollen and nectar uh, throughout the year through all three blooming seasons, spring, summer, and fall. The growing season is a time between the last frost in the spring and the first hard frost typically in the fall. Um, records show that on average the growing season in Ohio is around 190 days, which can range from basically early April through late October, um, depending on the specific region. Here in years past, we've from year to year, we've actually even gotten into November from time to time. It's recommended that a pollinator habitat contain a minimum of at least three different um, pollinator plants from each season um, or each one of those bloom periods. Um, and those bloom periods, again, early spring, midsummer, and early to late fall. Um, and that's ideally so that you maximize the benefit from all the pollinators. We have very different species throughout the year. They occur at different times. So to make sure that we have that, it's beneficial. So considering all that needs to occur, plants sprout, grow, and flower as pollinators feed and reproduce, it's a wonder how all this gets accomplished in just six months. With that in mind, pollinator habitats need to produce the maximum amount of food resources for the largest amount of time during the growing season to benefit the greatest number of pollinator species um, and, and other wildlife. So to encourage the greatest number of diversity of pollinators in the habitat, we want to include a diversity of plants with different flower color, sizes, shapes, as well as varying plant heights and growth habitats. Different pollinators have different preferences when it comes to the type of flowers that they utilize. For example, bees are most attracted to blues, purples, yellows, and whites, while butterflies will often favor reds, in addition to other colors. Um, the flowering morphology is also important as different pollinator species are ad adapted to specific types of flowers. Think about hummingbirds, for example. They require two shaped flowers for their tongue to be able to reach in and get into those pollinators. Other ones, think about bumblebees. They're not really as selective because they have large mandibles and they can rip open a lot of different plants if they make it tough. Honeybees, for example, yes, they're not a native pollinator, but they are an important pollinator currently on our landscape, are more of a generalist. You know, they'll go just about anywhere. They're in, they're out. They're very, they're very quick at what they do. So let's look at this size, color, shape, and structure. So we need to make sure that we include in the seed mix or, or in our management techniques to make sure that they, they maximize the diversity of flowering plants with those sequential bloom times so that flower resources are available throughout the growing season. We just talked about that and why it's important. Early season pollen and nectar source will increase the success rate of pollinators. Uh, that emerge early in the spring and begin nest building activities. Think about honeybees coming out early. A lot of our woody plants are producing things. So that's a good time of year. Um, and then that's also another reason why it's important to look at uh, planting shrubs, uh, wildlife beneficial shrubs, provide that early season bloomers. They are some of our early bloomers. We want to include three or four different species in each bloom period, understanding that each one of those pollinator species may occur at a different time. And since we already learned that different species like different colors and different shapes, if we only have one color or one shape during a whole season, there could potentially be several pollinator species that want to utilize uh, that area, but there is no food resources for them based off of their preference and you could lose entire populations of pollinators in your area just because of not having that diversity set up.
So here's a little bit that talks about our pollinator habitat and, and some of the benefits. So again, prairie diverse mixes of grasses and forbs. We want that good structure of the grasses with all those benefits of the flowers and forbs. Uh, we want it to be fairly open. There can be a percent tree cover because just we talked about those trees um, or those woodies early on can be very beneficial as a pollen and nectar source. They also provide, you know, winter uh, escape cover, roosting benefits. But that again, that's managing that succession between nothing and too much woodies. Uh, we want to have that bare ground component because we already talked about, um, I'm going to talk about the importance of that with that opening. And then low grass to forb ratio. The reason we want to start with low grass to forb ratio is that over time, grass succeeds faster than flowers and forbs, meaning they will become dominant and overpopulate an area started too thick too early. So as succession naturally occurs and the grasses become thicker and denser, we want to provide as much space out there for not only our flowers and forbs to, to occupy and produce that pollen and nectar for the insects, but also provide that bare open space and movement areas that a lot of our wildlife is going to need. So let's look at, so natives versus non-natives. So here is a picture of flowers, their root structure that a that occupies each one of these plants. Now I know it's very small and they're listed down here and we're not really concerned about which species they are, but just understand the basis of the group. The circle on the left is turf grass. This is what most of our lawns are. And as you can see, it's very dense and thick, but it has a very short root system. And this why when we get into the summer months and it gets drought, they turn brown and crisp up and we think they're dead. But as soon as we get rain, they shoot back up because everything happens within the first two, three, maybe four inches of the surface. So there's a lot that happens. So that's why we fertilize, that's why they lime, that's why they have a lot of treatments on turf grass because it all happens within those first couple inches. But if you look at these other circle, these are our natives. These are flat forbs and legumes. We have anywhere from eight to 20 foot root systems. So they get their food and resources from various depths of the soil. So liming, fertilizing, and a lot of those treatments don't benefit natives and they actually are detrimental, not because they hurt the plant, but because of what you do actually then gives any uh, short-rooted plants an advantage because again, they're only looking at this top area and most of the root mass of the natives are very, very deep. But these provide a lot of economic, ec environmental and economical benefits because they're long-lived. So again, the importance of pollinator trees and shrubs. So those early bloom periods, they're gonna provide um, mast for food later on, um, as well as escape and winter cover that I covered just a few moments ago. But we also, not only is this habitat beneficial to wildlife, it's very important to humans and our biodiversity. 75% of all flowering plants need pollination. And that's 35% of human food crops. One out of every three bite of foods that you take is directly related to pollination. And that's a huge factor. But pollen, pollinators are not only important to humans, but they're important to all of the species we're talking about. Specifically for this talk, pollinator habitat produces the base food source for the quail and pheasants, up to 85% of their diet throughout the year are the insects that are doing the pollination or the larvae form um, of, those, of those insects. So this just gives you an idea of, of out there, the amount of insects needed. Now this is just an Ohio bird study. It's general upland migratory birds. Um, they say that on average, a, a bird will make three, will take three bugs per trip. They'll make about seven trips per hour for 12 hours per day. That's about 242 bugs per day per nest. The average nesting period for our migratory birds is about 12 days. Well, that's about 3,000 bugs per nest. Well, if you sit there and think about how many birds come to your bird feeder, or if you go to a prairie or a pollinator area and you look out there, the amount of birds that are kind of moving around, now you really start to get a grasp on the large scale and the amount, sheer amount and number of insects that we need to produce to feed all of those species. So extrapolate that out multiple times for different species. Also look at our upland birds that are out there. That's quite a bit of food that 
that we need to produce. So that's why we need those multiple flowering plants and those all those different bloom periods in that proper structure so that we can provide all that good, this is your nesting and broodering area because this is what they're eating. So understanding that monarch and pollinator habitat helps all kinds of other wildlife at the same time. Whether it's our pheasants and our quail, also provides habitat for rabbits, our pollinators, which yes, frogs can be pollinators, our other nesting birds that are out there, a lot of our upland birds that are moving through. So Howard Vincent, president and CEO of Pheasants Forever said it best, in the end what's good for pollinator and monarchs is good for pheasants, quail, and other game or non-game species alike. We understand and that's the understanding of that pollinators are the umbrella species. Well, through our years of working with this, PF and QF biologists have collectively, the wildlife through successful restoration projects has kind of told us what works and what doesn't. We've learned from our mistakes. We've been out there, we've done a lot of this. A lot of the wildlife professionals in whole over the last 10 years have learned a lot and it's basically been by the direct response of the species that we're targeting on the habitat management practices that we've kind of done out there. So let's look at, we'll use Bob White for example. Let's look at it from their level. Understanding that a Bob White quail is simply the size of a baseball. Yes, they're a little bit taller, but when you really put it down, that's about the size of, of, of a baseball. So take a baseball, throw it out into the cover or habitat that you currently have or you're looking at, and understand where it lies and, and potentially what disadvantages or what obstacles that quail might have to use. Again, and then we extrapolate up. Pheasants are a little bit bigger, so they can tolerate a little bit more, a little bit more cover. Well, let's take a look at a quick video, and this will give you another idea of what we're talking about. So these are pheasant chicks. So, but understanding the size and remember the picture of the bare open ground and why it's important. These chicks are are looking for seeds, but mostly they're insects. When they're young and little, they're all after those fleshy little invertebrates that are out there. And without that bare open ground, they just aren't gonna be able to move freely through the area. Understanding that quail chicks are even smaller. They're about the size of your thumb when they come out of that egg and are trying to move around. So if we have dense turf grass or some even cover that's very, very thick that we'll look at later, if we don't have that open area, we're not gonna have these chicks. They're not gonna be able to move through. They're gonna expend a lot of energy uh, and not get the value and not very many of them are going to make it. But it's not just important to pheasant chicks or quail chicks. Let's think about native bees. There are 4,000 native bee species. About, and they're about five times more efficient at pollination than honeybees. Spend a lot of time out there. But 70% of them nest in the ground. And they only travel about two, maybe 300 yards, and they need everything within that arrangement. So if you think about that, is that's why that bare open ground throughout our field is important. Not only to have the ground for the seeds that fall off of our, our flowers, if they're annuals or even biennials to regenerate. Not only to have that bare open ground so those pheasant chicks or quail chicks or even the adults and other birds to be able to move freely through that substrate to be able to find the food that they need, but a lot of our key pollinators are out there and utilize that bare ground to nest in. Um, and without that, you know, our, our pollination that we have is definitely not going to be as successful and we're not going to have nearly as much. So throughout the state, you know, we've got a lot of CRP ground, we've got a lot of, you know, old prairies and things like that, but understanding that what's out there may not be quality habitat. So we've got fields that have early succession in it. We've learned that that's decent. We need to manage that. So coming up with plans to start controlling the woodies that are out there be before they become dominant, but also understanding that grass structure, uh, where we're out there and, and, and is it beneficial? You know, from one person's view, maybe, but when you get in there, 
you know, this here is almost seven inches of deep thatch. That's residual buildup. Well, remember those chicks that we just saw, they're not getting through this. They're getting on top of it, but they're not being able to reach the ground level. And even adult birds would have time moving through a lot of this, a lot of this area. And do we have the right structure so it doesn't lay down or bridge over and gives us that good winter habitat that we're looking for? And, you know, and yes, why thick grasses do provide some of that winter escape cover, a lot of it does only occur around the edges or near where there's been disturbance or open spaces where birds can get underneath this. But again, they need that open ground to be able to move through it. So remember, we need to be able to have that open ground and that view like this, and that's gonna serve lots of benefits throughout the year that we're learning about. So let's look at what we can do. Um, this is kind of a of a step by step restoration. This is an old field. Remember that monocultural picture that I had early on, and in what we can do out there. You know, we did management on one side, not the other. Whether this is herbicides, whether this is burning with fire, um, whether this was some kind of mechanical. I mean, even short mowing, tillage, plowing, uh, breaking up the existing structure that's out there and throughout the year providing a little bit more benefits that are out there. Now this is an annual sunflower species that's kind of come in, but understanding that the non-upgraded portion is, is seven inches of cover. It's very short, it's thick, not, not a lot to move through. There's no diversity. It's not drawing insects um, for that food basis that all of those species are gonna need. Um, to an upgraded portion that's deeper and 20, 20 inches of cover, so you think about how high that is, that's a lot more area for a lot of different species to occur. Uh, some of those pollinator species that may live within six inches of the ground or ones that only live in the canopy, but a lot more bare open ground area, again, for species to move through. You can see the disturbance, you can see where things have happened. Uh, this is that hat to give you that structure. Here, we've got that bare open ground area on the right hand side. Um, for everything to be utilized. Um, another thing to consider is that cattle. Um, I know that in certain areas, um, it's, we have a working lands for wildlife uh, program now that really focuses on using cattle for grazing native warm season grasses and providing that structure out there. So if you have cattle, that can definitely be a disturbance um, that can help manage that cover. So the picture on the left is, a, is, a, is an area that's been grazed Picture on the rice is one that's been currently done. You can see that after the cow grazed it, there is definitely open areas around it. They constantly eat off what would normally become that thatch that we saw previously in a picture that was very deep and that would limit birds from getting through. So now that you have this area um, that things can move through. And understanding that, you know, it's not only warm season grasses, but cool season grasses can be beneficial too, as long as they're the right ones. And I'm gonna give you a real quick definition of the difference. Cool season grasses typically are growing between 60 and 75 degrees. That's usually, and if you look at the bottom picture, that's late February um, into about the beginning, towards the end of June, maybe beginning of July, we have a summer slump and then it picks up late September, um, you know, and then until the, the first hard frost. So it's kind of an up and down. Well, that includes species like tall fescue, orchard, timothy. Again, we're looking at those cool season bunch grasses, not a lot of turf grass, um, because turf grass, yes, it's a cool season and it grows during that same period of time, is really not beneficial to wildlife. So where cool seasons can be beneficial is they can give us some of that early season structure that some of these species may need. So it doesn't always have to be native warm season grasses as long as the structure is there. And then of course, our native warm season grasses are growing during during those summer months, when those temperatures get up above 80 degrees and even hotter, um, that's when they're really productive during that summertime when all that cool season is actually slumping down. Now, the, even though that they fall off towards the end of September to October, the benefits of natives as cool season, their structure maintains and even through winter, depending on the species that's out there, um, which is like switchgrass, does very well through winter, little blue stem stands up, whereas a lot of times we shy away from Indian and big blue, simply because they can become aggressive monocultures and usually with Ohio snow and ice, they will fall down and lay, lay flat and not provide the kind of structure that switch and little blue will. Eastern grandma grass is utilized very limited in Ohio, mainly for production or grazing in some areas. 
Um, it can provide good habitat. It just has a little bit more complexity when we're talking about planting or management. So understanding the benefits of, of a lot of our wildlife species in with our agricultural setting, i.e. grazing or other livestock is, you know, cattle or other livestock that's out there can be used as a management tool because they do manage by them eating what's out there and trampling some of it down, they're maintaining that succession there before it gets to shrubs and trees where we have limited use or, you know, but we don't have too many and bear pastures aren't benefit for everything. So as long as they're rotated or maybe we have cool and warm season pastures where they move from, they can provide a lot of habitat, not only to bob whites, pheasants, upland songbirds, but also to pollinator species as well. So let's look at some keys to quail habitat, because again, whereas pollinator is an umbrella species that a lot of these, um, a lot of these um, species will, will occupy that pollinator habitat, the same thing can be said about quail and the management techniques that we utilize will benefit a lot of the other species. So we're maintaining, the, maintaining or managing those habitat edges. So that woody cover near the grass cover provides that winter escape cover, but by managing it, we're keeping that tall woody vegetation from moving all the way into those upland fields. And quail habitat is not clean. It's not gonna be nice and pretty and uniform and flat. You know, we need that edge. Uh, we need that, that, that basically that ski slope from tall to short. We don't want hard edges. And because those hard edges um, help predators. Whereas if we have that nice transition, that transition area gives a lot of species the habitat that they need, but also that softness between what would be woods or even going the other direction, what would be overly grazed pasture or lawn. And also understanding that the highest percentage of mortalities like on quail are from hawks, um, Cooper hawks in particular, um, eh, but a low proportion of mortalities, you know, happen from other ones like foxes or, or minks and, and, and coyotes. So really avian predators were the number, are, are the number one predator of a lot of our upland species, you know, in the state of Ohio. Um, but you go to say in other states where there are higher populations of these species, they have predators too. Yes. So again, it's not predator control can be important, but essentially it's it's the habitat. If they have the habitat and the structure, they live with predators. Again, they're prey species, they're going to have some loss, but essentially their mechanism for reproduction in large numbers, they can handle mortality. But if they don't have the cover to get them through from one season through the winter into the next breeding season, if their population drops too low, then they can't recover. So that's why we need to maintain that cover because it's, it's that predator issue that happens. And a lot of it's that late winter when we have long snow events and that the habitat finally breaks down, those birds get pushed out further and further away from cover. From this picture, you can see there are some native grass in the background, but again, that covers deep enough. There's not enough open ground and the thatch layer kept the birds from utilizing that area. So now they're out into the open area looking for seeds and things like that. And then that opens them up for more predation. So if we would have had more of a woody edge from the wood lot in the back before that grass structure, or even more of a woody structure to the fence line, those birds would be able to move around, feed as needed, and have a lot, a little bit more protection. So we'll look at some of the techniques to creating that softer edge that benefits pollinators, it'll benefit upland birds as well as pheasants and quail. So edge feathering is one that's typically it's softening the edge. It's taking some of those undesirable species that we have and a nice transition between what we would talk about a whole field and the big edge. So here is a picture of kind of one being started. Uh, you can see the open field on the right, the wood lot on the left, and it was a pretty hard edge. There's definitely some invasive species in there. Um, and then this will allow for some of that transition. Here's another before and after. You can see the tops of some of those trees that have been, that have been dropped. And what that does is allows now we'll have successional species come up through those tops and create that stem density. So now that they'll have a softer edge from the woods to the field, over winter, a lot of that will happen. That'll be edgy cover that things can utilize. It'll be weedy, 
Um, it will have a lot of natural um, succession in it. So we'll have some of those native flowers that it comes in there. But what it does is it provides, again, that transition area that's, that's important. Here's another demonstration of maybe a, just a draw area. So you can see where this is a hay field um, and not that uh, we do have lots of populations uh, of birds that utilize hay fields and as long as mowing and timing is done correctly, but essentially making sure that this hay field is not right up to a hard edge. Um, the after effect was just softening some of that edge, making it a little bit more brushy from a transition so that it can be more utilized and more highly valuable. Um, for species over time. So thinking about those native shrubs that are out there, um, there this is native shrubs. There are some uh, rubus species in here like blackberry and raspberry, uh, but essentially if you think about any native, any native flowering shrub can be beneficial. It's not only beneficial to quail as thickets and escape cover, um, it's beneficial to pheasants and other upland birds as far as food sources. It's beneficial to pollinators because that pollen and nectar that's being provided, uh, they get the feed as well as drawing the insects to those areas um, are definitely areas that they can be fed upon with those other, those same species. So it, whether we're talking about pheasant habitat, quail habitat, upland bird habitat, uh, or pollinator habitat, utilizing the areas and making sure that we have that diversity out there in the landscape is gonna be very important. So just wanted to give you guys uh, some pictures of, of some areas that have had those, those, those buffers put in. Um, it doesn't mean that we can't have a, a working community because we can from agricultural to um, golf courses, to corporations, to roadsides, to power lines. Uh, we're utilizing a lot of this habitat out there to soften those edges, provide those corridors, um, and provide good quality habitat. So since we weren't able to actually be at the Gwen um, and do a prairie walk, uh, we are in the process of, of converting the, the, the prairie in front of the cabin. Um, it's gonna be more demonstration plots, but it's gonna have a nice look. They're just gonna all look a little bit different so that individuals, groups, or communities that wanna do pollinator or habitat projects can go out there and, and look at the different size and structure and and species that are utilized and pick what fits well with them. Thought I'd take you guys on a, a demo site that we have um, with the Ohio Division of Wildlife at their Urbana Game Farm. Um, take a real quick little walk through there um, and, and, and take a look at some of these species that are out there and, and what some of these, what some of this pollinator habitat looks like. So lots of, lots of minority out there. Um, that's bergamot, that's the, the light purple flower. Definitely have some um, purple cone. Uh, there's some Queen Anne's lace or wild quer carrot. It's pretty much all over the landscape in Ohio. It comes on its own. We don't really plant it. Um, on this particular site, there's lots of black-eyed Susans. There's lots of gray-headed coneflower. Um, actually has some cup plant there you can see in the photo that kind of came in naturally on its own. Um, that must have been in the seed bank because it wasn't one that we planted. Um, and this was taken in July. Um, during the hot, dry months. So, you know, definitely can understand where, where pollinator habitat, if you look at the diversity of the species that are out there. Um, and this is about five foot tall. So actually it got pretty big this year, um, but down underneath there's lots of bare open ground like we already showed the pictures. So again, um, I'm Mike Redder. Here's some of my information. Um, I appreciate you taking the time to listen to my talk today. Um, hope you learned anything. If you have any questions, please reach out to me. I'll be more than happy. If you have a habitat project you would like to do, please reach out. We'd be more than happy to help you. Um, and we look forward to, to seeing some quality habitat and landscape in the future.